Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How to Use an iPad for Your Law Practice, presented by Jeff Richardson. My name is Stephanie Phelan, I'm a Marketing Manager at MyCase and I will be your host today. First, I'd like to give you a few tips about participating on GoToWebinar. The webinar control panel is on the right hand side of your screen. This is where you can control audio, chat with me, and submit questions. Please use the question pane to submit your questions at any time during the webinar. I'll be collecting those questions and saving them to ask Jeff at the end of the presentation, so please don't wait until the very end to shoot those over to me. Also, please that these slides and the recording will be available by end of day tomorrow on the MyCase blog, and it will also be emailed to all registrants. When you close your webinar today, a two-question survey will pop up. All you have to do is answer one of these survey questions, and you will be entered to win a $100 Apple gift card. Lastly, the Twitter hashtag to follow the conversation is hashtag iPad for lawyers if you want to tweet along during the presentation. Today's webinar is hosted by MyCase, so before we jump into things, I'd like to give you a quick overview. MyCase is a web-based law practice management software that takes care of your daily practice requirements for calendaring, contact management, document management and templates, time and billing, client communications, custom workflows, and more in one solution at an affordable price. MyCase is priced for solo and small firms at just $39 a month per attorney and $29 a month per paralegal or support staff. We also offer MyCase websites for our customers. The cost to set up and build your website is only $500, and then there's a $50 per month maintenance fee. We use a modern professional design built for your firm. The websites contain social media and blog integration. And best of all, a client portal which is completely integrated with your MyCase software. So now you and your customers can log into MyCase directly from your website. And now for a new feature. Approved MyCase customers can accept payments directly from client checking accounts, also known as eCheck or ACH payments, for free with no third-party integration required. By linking MyCase's legal billing tools to your operating and trust accounts, you can seamlessly accept online payments into your MyCase account. Best of all, the eCheck payment feature was created with the unique needs of lawyers in mind. Unlike other business payment processing options, it's designed to protect your trust account so you can rest easy knowing that it complies with trust account regulations. And last but not least, we enjoy hosting educational events for professionals in the legal industry, and that's why we're all here today. So let me tell you a little bit our, about our presenter. Jeff Richardson grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and has been using computers since his parents brought, bought him a Sinclair ZX81 back in 1981. It was basically a giant keyboard, and a typical setup involved a black and white television and a cassette recorder. Needless to say, Technology has come a long way, and Jeff has always been an early adopter. An attorney since 1994, Jeff practices law in the New Orleans office of Adams and Reese and serves on his firm's technology committee. Jeff's first Apple computer was a Mac Plus that he bought in college in 1988, and he has been a Mac user ever since while at home. Jeff, like many of you, uses a PC in his law office. He has cycled through several versions of the iPhone and iPad and has been wearing the Apple Watch since it went on sale in April last year. Jeff started the website iPhone JG in 2008 and it is the oldest and largest website for attorneys who use the iPhone and iPad. ABA Journal named iPhone JG the best legal technology blog in 2010, 11, and 13 and added iPhone JG to its Hall of Fame in 2014. Jeff, thanks so much for being here today. I'm going to let you take it over from here. Thank you for the introduction, Stephanie. I appreciate it. And thank you to all of you who have joined us today for the webinar or are watching this on video. <clears throat> As Stephanie said, um, I work uh, for a law firm called Adams & Reese, and I think the way that you use your iPhone and iPad in some ways is a reflection of the type of practice you have. Um, I happen to work for a large firm of over 300 attorneys. We have offices all throughout the South, and I'm right here in the New Orleans office. Um, and so I tend to work in bigger cases. Most of my practice is uh, defending companies sued in class actions and other complex litigation, but every once in a while I have some smaller cases too. 
And then my, uh, my side fun project is the iPhone JD website that Stephanie mentioned. You can get to it from any of your devices. Just type iPhoneJD.com and you'll jump right there. Um, but with that, today we're going to be talking not about the iPhone specifically, but about the iPad. And um, as we start off today, um, one of the first things I'd like to do is take advantage of the poll feature that we have here. And so we're going to start right off with poll question number one. And poll question number one is, do you use an iPad today? The five possible answers are A, no. Uh, so if you use another tablet but not an iPad, you can answer no if you use something else. B is yes, I use one of the um, earlier iPads, the iPad, the iPad 2, the iPad 3, the iPad 4. C is if you use one of the newer iPads, the iPad Air or the iPad Air 2. D is if you prefer the smaller version of the iPad, the iPad mini, and there have been a couple of versions of those. Any of those will do. And finally, if you're using Apple's newest and largest iPad, the iPad Pro, you can hit E. Okay, great. Thank you. So please, everyone, go ahead and submit your uh, survey, your poll responses there, and I'm going to close the poll. And the results are in. So 18% um, say no, they don't use an iPad today. And then our majority, which is 38%, said yes, the original iPad, iPad 2, 3, or 4. 27% um, said yes, the iPad Air or the iPad Air 2. 13% are using the uh, iPad mini. And 5% use the iPad Pro. Is that about what you expected to see, Jeff? Uh, it was. It is that that is pretty uh, consistent. Um, and in fact, let's take a look at some of the numbers overall. Every year, the American Bar Association asks attorneys what kind of technology that they use. The iPad came out in 2010, and since 2011, they've been asking about tablet use. And as you can see from the chart on your screen, from 2011 to 2013 tablet use rose considerably so that once we got to 2013 you could say that about half of all attorneys were using some form of a tablet most most of those were using the iPad it was by far the most popular uh, but some folks use some of the other ones as well since 2013 it has basically remained stable and um, this is actually also true outside of the legal industry too just in general that a whole bunch of folks have adopted iPads but um, for some reason, it's sort of gotten to a point where the folks that have one have it and other folks haven't been jumping on quite as much. And folks who do have iPads haven't been buying new ones um, as quickly as people buy an iPhone. Many people buy an iPhone, every, a new smartphone or iPhone every two years. Um, and it was interesting looking at these poll numbers that although um, almost a fifth of you um, don't have an iPad at all, um, a large majority of you have one of the older iPads, so the iPad 4 has been out a little bit more recently, but there are a ton of attorneys who are currently using an iPad 2 or an iPad 3, and um, if you are one of those, you might want to start thinking about upgrading because those are starting to get slow enough that you don't get to take advantage of some of the new technology that we'll talk about today. Um, a number of you, actually I'll also mention just to put it in context, although about half of attorneys use iPads, probably 90% of attorneys use a smartphone, uh, so that just sort of shows you the difference between tablets and um, phones. Um, for those smartphones, about 60% use an iPhone and the other 30% use something else, mostly Android, uh, but there's still a lot of attorneys that like the Blackberry or, or the Windows phones or other ones that are out there. If you're looking to buy your first iPad or if you have an older one and you're looking to upgrade, a question that I'm asked all the time is, you know, which one of the iPads should I buy? Because it's not just one of them. There's so many of them out there. Right now, Apple has three basic uh, different models. They have the iPad, uh, what I consider just the standard iPad. If you're not sure what to get, you just get this one, and that is the 10-inch iPad Air. Currently, it's called the iPad Air 2, and it is a fabulous computer. It's very fast. It's, it's fast. I say computer because it's fast as a computer. It's more than fast enough to get all of your work done. It's got a nice size screen. I, I love the Air 2. Um, the Mini uh, which according to that poll we just took, about 13% of you were using. I like the Mini, and I, ha I do own one that I used to use. Um, the nice thing about the Mini is that it's so light and small. Um, you, know, you can put it in a purse or, or slip it you know, almost in a big coat pocket. What I don't like about the Mini for getting my legal work done, though, is when I'm looking at documents, which is a big part of what I use an iPad for, you know, PDF documents or transcripts or whatever, the mini screen is pretty small. If you've got really good eyesight, that's fine, but, um, but otherwise, I think the mini is probably better suited for more of an entertainment device. It's, it's great for reading books, for example, because you can adjust the font size on books, but you can't 
easily adjust the font size on like a PDF file when your opposing counsel sends you the opposition to your motion for summary judgment. Um, and then the whole landscape changed substantially um, this uh, just a few weeks ago when Apple came out with the iPad Pro. And I've been using one for a few weeks. I wrote a review of it on iPhone JD a few weeks ago, and it is the longest uh, review that I have ever published on my website um, because I had a lot to say. It is really a different type of iPad. The larger screen on it, really close to the size of a, a screen of a, um, of a, of like a laptop computer, is uh, it makes all the difference in the world. And I say that in both a good and a bad way. The good is that the iPad Pro screen is basically the same size as an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. So when you're looking at a document on the screen, it's basically the same size that it would look um, if it was printed out, which is really nice because it means that you don't have to squint. You don't have to pinch your fingers to zoom a little bit and then, then scroll back and forth. You look at one half of the page, then the other half of the page. You just look at the document the way it was intended to be looked at. Um, and whether you're annotating or highlighting or just reading, it is so nice. At the same time, there's a cost associated with it too. The iPad Pro, um, it's bigger, so it's heavier. Now, it's the same weight approximately as the first generation iPad that came out in 2010. So it's not like you're carrying around a truck or anything like that. You can totally hold it in your hand. Um, and in fact, because it's bigger and the weight is distributed over a larger surface area, uh, it actually seems a little bit lighter than you think it would be when you first look at it. But when you look at an iPad Air, it is, it is big. But I'll tell you, my experience and folks that I've talked to who have also purchased an iPad Pro say that after you've used it for about a week or two, um, it seems like the right size. And then when you go back to an iPad Air, uh, it seems tiny. It's like, oh, look at this cute little toy <laughs> iPad. And then you look at an iPad Mini and it might as well be you know, a Matchbox or something. It seems so small. So it's, you very easily get used to the size. And although it's a tiny bit more awkward to hold in your hand, um, I'm convinced that the iPad Pro is the right one for me, um, especially for one reason that I'll get to in a second. But it's, it's a tough decision if you're looking to upgrade or to buy your first iPad. Um, I think for most folks, the iPad Air 2 is going to be fabulous. But if you think that you would enjoy seeing your documents full size, um, I love the iPad Pro. It, it really is a nice tablet. So let's talk about getting some work done with your iPad in your law practice. Um, and um, you know, I don't even have slides devoted to just you know, strict consumption. I mean, of course, you can look at websites and stuff like that, and that's all fabulous. But let's talk about going up to the next level a little bit more and actually getting some work done. The thing that we all do as attorneys, whether you're a litigator like I am or transactional, you're always writing. You're writing on your computer. And with the iPad, it's nice that you can write with it too. Um, I, uh, I especially enjoy writing on an iPad when I am traveling, for example. I have not taken a laptop computer with me when I travel, gosh, probably in like three or four years now. It's been a long time because I like taking an iPad when I travel anyway because if I want to have like entertainment on the plane, I can watch a movie or stuff like that. And if I'm taking my iPad anyway, I really don't need a computer, but it is nice to have some sort of a keyboard to write with, which was why one of the first things I talk about when it comes to writing on a computer is using a keyboard. Uh, it's really nice when you're in the, in the hotel room at the end of the day, you want to catch up on your email, you can just prop up your iPad, uh, use an external keyboard and, um, or, or the on-screen keyboard and, um, and just get your work done. Let me talk first about the on-screen keyboard. The, the on-screen keyboard on the iPad, if you've used one, of course you know, you know what it is. But there, there's all sorts of tricks that you can use um, to become a little bit more of a power user. Um, I'll show you a few. I'm going to move my, uh, my cursor here, so hopefully you can see my little arrow right here. Um, one of the new features of the newest version of the operating system is this bar that's at the very top, which includes things on the left like undo and redo and something here you can hit to paste. You can very quickly paste something that you've copied from elsewhere. And they've got some little things over here to like you know, bold and underline. Um, one thing that you should know that with the new version, the latest version of the iOS, is if you're in the middle of typing a message and you say, whoa, like I'm typing this email, and I want to go look at something from another email real quick. If you um, put your uh, finger right near the top here where the title is and you just swipe down, you can actually push this email to the very bottom of your screen and it will live down there and stay out of your way and then you can go look at your other emails and when you're ready to pull this back, you just tap that and it comes right on back up again. 
when I do uh, live uh, presentations, I can show the slide, but it doesn't really work with a, a webinar like this, unfortunately. Another thing to keep in mind is you can always, if you want to put aside an email, you can tap on cancel over here, and when you tap on cancel, you'll get a dialog box asking if you want to discard or save the message. If you choose to save the message, and then in the future, whether it be later on that day or later on that week, when you go to, to hit the icon at the top right corner of the screen to compose a new message, instead of tapping that icon, if you hold down on that icon for a few seconds, you will see a list pop up of everything that you've saved. So putting things to the bottom of the screen is great if you just want to put it to the side for a minute, but if you started to type an email and you realize, gosh, I really need to come back on this this afternoon after I get some more stuff, just hit cancel and save it, and then do a long pause on the compose button to get it up. Another thing to talk about the keyboard in front of us is you should get to learn that each key can actually do more than just give you the letter that's on the key. And of course, you know you can hit the shift key to make things capital. We all know that. Um, and the bottom left corner here, you have the uh, question mark one, two, three key. And if you tap that, you will see the alternate ver version of the keyboard with the numbers and, the, and everything else. Um, but many of these keys, if you hold down on the key, you will get other possible things you can type. And a good example is in my email here, I'm typing the statute is 28 USC, and of course, I want to put the section mark next, right? And you may say, well, Jeff, I don't see the section mark, but it's there. If you put your finger on the ampersand and you hold down for about one second, you'll see a pop-up. And in the case of the ampersand, there's only one thing that pops up, but on some of these other keys, you may see one or two or three or four, you know, a list of things that pop up. If you were to hold down on the dollar sign, for example, you'll see a list of all sorts of different currency marks, you know, the pound and the yen. Uh, Russia recently, a few years ago, came up with a symbol for the ruble, and that, that's now added to the keyboard. Um, so this is a nice thing to know. Where's my section mark? It's there. You just need to know where to look for it. By the way, I'm showing you an iPad um, Air screen right now because that's what most of you are using. Um, a small percentage of you, like me, are using the iPad Pro. And one nice thing about the iPad Pro is it actually takes advantage of the larger screen to give you even more things on the keyboard. And so you'll see, for example, the numbers and the letters all at the same time without having to, uh, to hit that little uh, question mark one, two, three to get over to that mode. So get to know your keyboard um, because you can be a more powerful user if you know where things are. By the way, I did a post a year ago on iPhone JD called Sections and Pill Crows. Um, by the way, do any of you know what a pill crow is? Because I have to admit, I did not. <laughs> the pill crow is that, uh, the, uh, what I always think of as the paragraph symbol, but the technical word is the pill crow. But I did this post um, a year ago, and I went through and I put a list in the post of every alternative symbol that you can create from the keyboard. Um, so if you take a look at that, you know maybe you'll be thinking in the future, oh yeah, I remember you can make the such and such symbol because I saw it in that post. So that's just a little tip, a little homework for you. The next thing I would like to mention about the keyboard is the microphone. The microphone next to the space bar will trigger Siri's uh, dictation function, and I'm amazed at the number of attorneys who I talk to who tell me that they don't dictate things to their iPhone. Um, I will admit that in my law practice, I, I never dictate. I know some people like to dictate letters and have their secretary put them together. I type fast enough that I, and maybe I'm just enough of a type A person to control, that I like to have the control and do everything myself. Uh, but the one person I do dictate to is not my secretary, but it is my friend Siri. Um, dictation on the iPhone and iPad works works pretty well. It's not 100% accurate, but if you are in a quiet room, so you're not going to bother other folks, you know, I might be on the couch at home at night going through emails, and I want to respond to an email on my iPad, um, no matter how quick I might think I am, typing on the iPad keyboard, um, Siri is going to be faster. And so if you're not already in the habit, I encourage you to get into the habit of tapping that microphone button, speaking a couple sentences, and then uh, and give it a shot. And, and my experience, Siri is, I don't know, 98% accurate, which means it's going to mess up words every once in a while. But usually if you have to fix one or two messed up words, it's a lot faster than typing all of your words at once. And if you want to be more advanced with dictation, there's other things, um, uh, Nuance, which makes the Dragon products that some people use on their computer. They have apps on the iPhone that are made that you can dictate for long periods of time if you want to do that. Siri's best if you just want to dictate for a few sentences. Um, but if you don't use Siri, I encourage you to do so. So let's talk about external keyboards. 
Um, what, like, like, like I said, when I travel or when I'm away from a computer and I'm using my iPad as a computer replacement, um, when you're typing, whether you're you know creating a document or writing emails, it's nice to have an external keyboard. I have long been a fan of the ones that Apple makes, and the, what I like about them is that they're small enough to be you know easy to put in a briefcase, um, but they're also full-size keys. Um, they work with an iPad, but these are the same keyboards that you would get if you bought a Mac. So I mean, it, it's it's not like a compromised keyboard for the iPad. It is a true blue full-sized keyboard. Uh, the one that I use is the one at the top. This is what Apple had been selling until a few months ago, and you can still buy it on Amazon. It's the Apple Bluetooth keyboard. It costs about seventy dollars. Apple recently changed over to this new one. Uh, the old one, by the way, uses batteries inside of it, although the batteries last a long time, many, many months. Uh, the new one down here, which is called the Apple Magic Keyboard, it's a little bit more expensive at $100, um, and it has a lightning port, so you can charge it via a lightning cable the same way you would charge your iPad or your iPhone. So I like the Apple keyboards, but there's a million third parties that make them that are maybe a little bit cheaper. One third party keyboard that a lot of people like are the keyboards that are also a case for the iPad. One of the more popular ones is the Logitech um, Ultra Thin, uh, which you can get for around $80 on Amazon. And people like these because it makes the iPad sort of like a laptop because you can close it up and then open it up. I'm not a big fan of these for two reasons. One, I don't always want to use a keyboard with my iPad. Um, I want to have it in my briefcase so I can pull it out when I need it, but usually it just gets in the way for it to be there. Second of all, these keyboard cases, in order to fit the size of the iPad, which is not as long as a regular keyboard, they have to make the keys more tiny. And if you have smaller fingers, well, then you might not notice it much, and that might be fine. If you've got bigger fingers like I do, I, I always feel like I'm squinching up my fingers when I type on these crazy things. Um, now, if you have an iPad Pro, um, the keyboard cases for those, because the Pro iPad Pro is bigger, they actually do feature full-size um, keys, um, which is great, but it still doesn't get over my first problem, which is I don't like having a keyboard all the time. But if you you know, really want to use your iPad in place of a computer, and you want the keyboard all the time, I know people that swear by these keyboard covers and really like them. I want to talk about styluses next, and so this is a good time to do poll number two. If you use an iPad, and I know that some of you on the phone don't, but if you do use an iPad, my question is, do you use a stylus with your iPad? And there's only two answers here. A is yes, I do use a stylus, and that could just be sometimes. Um, and B, no, I don't use a stylus. My finger is more than enough for me. What are your answers? <laughs> okay, great. Okay, everyone, if you can please go ahead and cast your vote. And, okay, Jeff, looks like majority have voted. I'm going to go ahead and close. And the results are in. Uh, so 27% said yes, they use a stylus, and 73% do not use a stylus. Wow, that is very consistent with what I normally see. Um, people, uh, about a quarter of attorneys that I talk to tend to use a stylus, uh, styluses and three quarters don't. Um, let's talk about styluses and I'm going to begin, I don't want to bury the lead. The, the stylus world when it comes to iPads changed substantially a few weeks ago when Apple introduced the iPad Pro because Apple, for the first time ever, came out with their own stylus which they call the pencil. And the Apple Pencil is by far the best stylus that I have ever tried on any device. And I'm not just talking about iPad styluses. I'm talking about the, the, the well-reviewed stylus that comes with some of the Windows Surface tablets and even some of the super expensive Wacom tablets that like you know cartoonists and graphic artists use. Um, the, the pencil is fabulous. It is incredibly responsive. It's incredibly precise. Wherever you put the point on the screen, it writes. You can rest your hand, much like the gentleman in the uh, stock photo that I've got on the screen here do, and it won't make a mark on the screen underneath your hand. It knows to only write where the stylus tip is, and it's great. Um, but this only works for now if you have an iPad Pro. Um, otherwise, you need to get a different stylus. So let me talk about um, why you would want to consider using a stylus if you're not using one right now. Um, when you're working with documents, you know, it's, I find it's a lot easier, even if you're just doing things like highlighting, but certainly if you were annotating in the marginalia, you know, you know, reading a, a case, an opinion on your iPad and you want to write in the side, you know, this is the most important part or something like that. You can do that so much more easily with the stylus. 
Um, I also find that it's nice to use Stylus Assist to take notes, and I'm going to talk more about that in just one second. Um, but the thing is, if you get a stylus, there's a, a huge universe that you can get. One type of stylus is the traditional stylus, which has a tip that's a little bit thicker, like the ones that I have at the top of the screen here, the Wacom Bamboo styluses. And they need to be because up until the iPad Pro, all prior models of the iPad were only made to recognize something the size of your fingertip. And so they couldn't have really tiny tips because the iPad wouldn't sense them. And so there are tons of styluses. One of my favorite ones is the, the Wacom series, and they've actually come with three different generations. Generation 1 is a top. Uh, this is Generation 2 right here, and this is the one that they're selling right now. They're nice. They have a nice weight to them. They have a nice tip. Th these are great styluses. Um, uh, another type of stylus that you can use is, by the way, these cost about $30, is the powered styluses, the active styluses. And the first company to make one of these was Adonit with their script. And they have these tiny points at the end, which is great because you really feel like you were using a, um, a pencil or a pen. But I just told you that the iPad can't sense something that small. And the way that they get around it is the end of these things actually have radios. Whoops. The end of these things actually have radios in them. And they emit signals that the iPad is tricked into thinking is something bigger than the tip. And so they sort of fool the iPad um, into working, which is clever and creative. Um, but my problem is that as a result, they, uh, they don't tend to be as precise as a traditional uh, stylus, and they're certainly not as precise as the Apple Pencil, which is designed to work with the iPad. So they have some great ones out there. Adonit has a new one called the, uh, the Jot Dash, which is even thinner. So it's, it's, it's just as thin as a regular pen or pencil, and it's got a very fine point. And it works pretty well, but it's not perfect. Um, if I did not have an iPad Pro, and I was recommending just one stylus to buy. Uh, my personal favorite is also made by Adonic called the Jot Pro. It's sort of, in my mind, is the best of both worlds. It has a bigger tip at the end of it so that the iPad, uh, it, there, there's no batteries in this. It's just a regular traditional stylus. And it's got this disc at the end, which is big enough for the iPad to think that something the size of a fingertip is touching it. But it's attached to this fine point here, and so as a result, your eye, when you're writing with this thing, your eye doesn't really see the disc. You just see the point, and it gives you the illusion that you're writing with a fine tip pen, um, and you don't have to worry about batteries and power and everything else. Um, the Adonit Jot Pro is nice. It has a nice little clip built, built into it. I checked on Amazon this morning, and they are currently going for $27. Um, they work really, really well. And so what are you going to do with your stylus? Well, I already talked about you know, marking up cases. One thing that I like doing with styluses, styluses, styli, I don't know what it is, but I'll say styluses. Um, one thing I like doing with styluses is taking notes. Uh, if I'm in a meeting or sometimes if I'm in court, and it's a court that lets me use an iPad in there, which some courts are finicky about, but most are pretty good about, um, and I'm just sort of taking notes. Um, I enjoy taking notes on the iPad screen, and um, why do I enjoy doing that? Well, first of all, um, you know, I, it's just sort of old school. I, I just like taking notes anyway. But second of all, a lot of people say, well, why would I take notes with a stylus or, or a pen and pencil? I, sh I should just um, write everything using like a laptop computer. Well, it's, it's a lot noisier and more obnoxious to people around you if you're typing on a keyboard. But additionally, um, one thing that, I don't know if this is unique to attorneys or maybe everybody does this, I guarantee you that when you take notes using a computer with a full keyboard, your um, default position is going to be being a court reporter. You're going to start writing down every single word and transcribing. But when you take notes, whether you use old school pen and paper or a stylus on a computer, on an iPad screen, uh, you can't write everything because no one can write that fast. And so uh, your brain is forced to just sort of take down notes and write down the most important concepts. And there's been a number of studies uh, recently that say that um, if you take two equal people, one person who uses a laptop and basically types every word, and another person who uses pen and paper or stylus and actually just you know takes notes on the key concepts, that second person does a far better job of retaining what is important. And that makes sense because in the process of you taking notes, your brain is sort of distilling um, what is the most important thing from what's being said around you. Um, and so it's just the important stuff that your brain remembers. And so for me, I will often have meetings where I take notes, even if it's just like a meeting within my firm, um, and I never again look at my notes. But because I was taking notes as opposed to typing notes, I'm going to retain more information just in my brain. But if I do need to go back to those notes, the reason that taking digital notes is better than pen and paper 
is if you're like me, you take notes on paper and then you stick them in a folder and then who knows where they are and six months later you can never find them. Um, but when you take digital notes, everything's just right there on your iPad. And if I want to find notes that I took three years ago, you know, in like three seconds, I can pull them up, and, and it's very simple. The app, there's a bunch of great apps on the iPad for taking notes. The one that I currently use and prefer, and, and I have been preferring for quite a while now, a while now is called GoodNotes, G-O-O-D. N O T E S and uh, good notes, which is shown on the screen right here. The way it works is you have your piece of paper up here, and you can change this to be, you know, whatever kind of paper you want. And then at the bottom of the screen, um, this blue box here is expanded at the bottom. So the idea is that you write at the bottom of your screen, and as you write, those words appear at the top of the screen. Now, why does it do it that way? The reason it does it that way is on a regular iPad because the tip is not that precise, um, you can't take advantage of an entire screen. And into something that's the size of a traditional sheet of paper, you would have to write too tiny on the full screen. But it's easier to write a little bit larger at the bottom here and then have it shrunk down. So you take notes, and as you get to the end, like after you type this, the R and the word over, the fox jumped over, when I'm ready to, type my, to, to write my next letter, I'm sort of running out of space here, but that's okay because when I get to the end, the app automatically, you see this R here? It's the same R as over here. I just pick up my stylus and go over here, and I just write the next word. What would be the fox jumped over? The. So I would start typing the, the lazy dog, and then again, once I get to the end here, I go back here. Um, so that's how it works on a traditional iPad or an iPad mini. Now, I'll tell you, if you have an iPad Pro, I have found that because the pencil is more precise and because the iPad Pro screen is so much larger, Again, it's about the same size as a regular size legal pad, not, not a legal size legal pad, but a letter size legal pad. Um, you don't actually need, you can just turn off this bottom part with the box. You can just write directly on the screen, which is even faster. Um, but if you have a different type of iPad, um, these programs work. Um, so that's, of course, taking notes, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about more things on Marginalia. But if you don't currently take notes with a stylus, you can get one for cheap. I encourage you to check it out. Um, they're also fun to use just when you're like using your iPad. Sometimes you don't feel like swiping through screens with a finger. Just holding a stylus in your hand is just a, just a different way to interact and it's nice. Okay, let's move over. I have been talking about using Word documents on an iPad for years now. And for many years, you know, there were all these third-party apps that would do an okay job with Word documents, but none of them were perfect. Uh, there was one called DataViz, uh, by a company called DataViz, called Documents to Go, that was one of the better ones, but it had some issues. And then, you know, what everybody wanted was for Microsoft to just come out with Microsoft Word on the iPad. Um, but nobody thought it was going to happen because, you know, Microsoft and Apple, aren't they like enemies and competitors, blah, blah, blah. Well, Microsoft um, has realized over the last uh, couple of years that um, it's, although they, of course, prefer for people to use a PC with Windows or one of their, ta their, their tablets, they are happy for to use Microsoft software even if you're using a device made by someone else. So much like for years and years and years now, you could use Microsoft Word on a Mac, now you can use Microsoft Word on an iPhone or iPad. And although the third-party products that support Word documents are still being sold, I frankly don't encourage you. If you're an attorney, um, I, you should just get the real Word. Because even if you're a Word Perfect user, you know that so many people around you are using Word. And my guess, I, I didn't put a poll question on this, but my guess is if I put a poll and asked how many of you are using Word, that, that would, you know, far, far more people are using Word than other Word processors. Microsoft Word on the iPad is not free. Well, well it is free. The app itself, itself can be downloaded for free, but the license terms say that in order to use it for commercial um, purposes, and they even include pro bono in their commercial definition, uh, you have to have a paid license, and it costs uh, 99 basically 100 bucks a year. But for 100 bucks a year, that's not just for the iPad version. That is for the full Office 365. So that would also pay for Microsoft Word with updates as they come out on your computer, on your phone, on your tablet, you know, everywhere. Um, so if you don't currently, you know, some of you may have a copy of Word that you purchased outright. If you're not currently paying a subscription price, well, then this is something different. But if you are already a subscriber, to Office 365 to use Microsoft Word and Excel and Outlook and all the others, then uh, basically you've got the iPad app for free. And it is a great app. It is full featured. Um, there are a few things that the desktop version of Word can do 
that the iPad version can't do, but they are few and far between. Um, you know, you've got your basic tabs, home, insert, layout. You can type in each tab, and you get all your your ribbon bars, just like on the computer. Um, you know, you can type, you can review um, everything that you need to do. You've got save buttons up here. You've got buttons over here to share, like to email a file to someone else. Um, the biggest omission for me personally is that I use styles on my uh, PC at work and on my Mac at home, and so I will have like a style that's like a block paragraph, and I will have a style that's like a double spaced paragraph with the first line indented, you know, uh, a half an inch. Those styles, the iPad version will uh, recognize them, but it's very finicky in letting you create new ones. Um, although there are some features built in, it's so crippled that I, I just essentially say that you can't really apply new styles on the iPad. So that's the one big omission that I found, but um, but except. Other than that, I mean, everything else just just works, and it works works really well. So, why do you want to use Word? Well, first of all, if you're typing a document, you know, you might, and you're going to eventually have it in Word in the computer. You might as well have it in Word here. But even if you're not doing anything more in your iPad than just like reading emails, I still encourage you to get Word. And let me show you why. Here's an example. Um, I'm on my iPad. I've got an email. Someone sends me something called contract with comment. And as you know, if I just tap on, imagine my finger just tapping right here. If I tap on the icon, it will open the document in sort of a viewer mode. And so in that viewer mode, I can look at the document, scroll up and down. The formatting is not 100% the same as what it would look like on Microsoft Word. But it's pretty close, and so, um, for example, I can see here the compensation, you know, $100,000, $1,000 per day. So you might look at this and you say, yeah, this looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and forward this on and, and be on my merry way, right? No, no, don't do that. Well, you should have known not to do that because it says contract with comments. When you just use the built-in viewer, you're not seeing any of the metadata. What you should instead do is hold down your finger on the attachment. And when you hold it down, after a second, you'll get a pop-up window that, and this will scroll right here, that gives you all of the apps you can use that can open the document. And of course, the best one to use is Microsoft Word. And so if I tap on Word, and I open this document within Word on my iPad, well, suddenly I'm going to see that there are red line edits here that were not showing up in the viewer. And there's comments, like $1,000 per day, there's a comment here, is this the right amount? If you were to share this document with opposing counsel, um, I mean, I, I hate to use the malpractice word, but let's just say it would not be a happy day. You don't want to go there. Um, so I really think that attorneys, you need to have Word, even if you're going to do nothing more than use it for a viewer when someone else sends you documents. And then, of course, because Word on the iPad and the iPhone support red lines, if someone sends you a document and you're out of the office and you want to just add another sentence here and delete some things there, you can just do it right there on your iPad or your iPhone um, without having to find a computer and sit down. So, you, you know, red lines are great because you might want to use them yourself, but even if it's nothing more than keeping the ability to see red lines that other folks have created, um, I, I think it's worth, worth the price of admission for that alone. So that's Microsoft Word. Let's move on to other types of documents, um, PDF files. And that's probably, for me, the number one file type. Well, maybe not. Word might be the most popular file type that I deal with in my law practice, but PDFs are getting up there, especially in federal court where everything's e-filed and, and more states are getting there. There are a bajillion apps on the App Store that can deal with PDFs. Um, my favorite is the one that's on the left here, Goodreader, although I, I have a bunch of other ones too because sometimes I use some of the power features and some of the other one. I'm just going to talk about Goodreader here. I, you know, I tell folks when they get their first iPad that the best five bucks you can spend on your iPad when you first get it is to get a copy of Goodreader because Goodreader is nice not only as a way to view and annotate PDFs but even just to store them. When you have the app, um, at the home level, you, have a li you can have a list of all of your folders. And so at my, I'm not showing it right here, but my home screen will have all of my cases, like you know, Smith versus Jones and you know, the, the, the next case and the next case. And if I tap on any one of those cases, just like on your computer, you might open up a folder, you have whatever subfolders you have. And so then I could then click on, let's say maybe I'll click on the research folder, and here are some of my cases in here. And then if I tap onto a case, I can actually view the case on a screen. And if I tap in the middle of the screen, all of these bars around the edges will go away. Um, or I can tap again and they'll come up. And so if I want to highlight, I can get my highlighting tool. If I want to add a comment, if I want to 
you know, use this tool right here just to scribble, to scribble, uh, um, to write a note like this is key, uh, whether I use my finger or even better, a stylus. Um, you can add circles and squares and all sorts of other things. There's nice annotation tools, um, and there's sophisticated tools too. I mean, you can even go to modes where you see um, um, each one of the pages, and so I can move a page, like if, if the document's out of order and page four is supposed to be where page three is, I can go ahead and do that. Um, and it works really, really well. If I can go back a screen, uh, one thing that you'll note is that some of these folders that I have have these green circles right here. And what that means is um, the question I often get is, how do you get your documents into Goodreader? And for me, I have two different answers. For documents that I consider more public, like certainly the pleadings and correspondence with opposing counsel, um, stuff that there's nothing private about it at all, I usually just use Dropbox, and I'm sure a lot of you use Dropbox as well. And so I have a folder on my computer, my Dropbox folder, and inside of it I've got you know 100 different subfolders. And then on uh, Goodreader, uh, using the connect feature over here, I can select which one of those subfolders I would like to sync over to my iPad. And so every time I tap the sync button down here, it will look and anything new added on my computer will sync over, and anything that I've edited on my uh, laptop, I mean on my iPad, such as these uh, highlights and these annotations, when I sync, they will go back to my computer. And so then I've got the updated version everywhere. For documents that I want on my iPad, which are more private, uh, like the letter that I wrote to my client about how we can win the case, um, or even worse, how we might lose the case, I don't trust Dropbox for that because Dropbox is a third party. And even though they, they say they keep things confidential, They've certainly never signed a confidentiality agreement with me or my law firm, and you know who knows what a rogue employee might do or something like that. I just don't trust them, and so I will usually email the file to myself or use some other third-party devices that I'm not going to talk about today, like a transporter, which is like sort of a personal version of, a, of cloud storage. Um, so I use that for more secure documents. But for me, as a litigator, 90% of what I want on my iPad is every pleading for every case that I work on, including closed, closed files too, because I might want to look back at that you know, motion I wrote two and a half years ago to read the argument because it may apply in a new case that I have. And Dropbox and Goodreader are perfect for that. Sometimes you need to actually get on your computer. Like maybe you have a specific program that only runs on your PC, or maybe you just went to the airport and you're like, oh darn it, I had that document on my desktop and I forgot to, to stick it on Dropbox, or I forgot to email it to myself. Um, it's nice for those situations to have remote access software, and there's quite a few programs that allow remote access. Um, Citrix is nice because it lets you get sort of a virtual PC, a virtual computer. Uh, I like LogMeIn because LogMeIn lets me actually connect to my computer, and when you have the app running, as long as the computer in your office or your home or whatever is turned on, and I just keep it on all the time, um, you can, on your iPad screen, see uh, your Windows or your Mac screen just as if you were there. And so that's nice because then you can go in and you can um, you know, do something in Outlook that you otherwise might not be able to do on your iPad or you can get that file on your desktop and email it to yourself. And um, it's especially nice on the iPad Pro with the big screen. Accessing a computer through a remote uh, access like this, it's not perfect, but it works pretty well. It's more than good enough in a pinch, and I find it uh, a useful enough part of my practice that um, I probably use it um, on my iPad dash, I don't know, at least once a week or something like that. So that's something to look at. I next want to talk about some security issues, and I have the next poll question. And poll question number three is, do you use a passcode lock on your iPhone and iPad? A is yes, I do use a passcode lock. B is no. I don't. C, I plead the fifth, and I'd rather not tell you <laughs> whether I use a passcode. And D, I do use a passcode, and indeed, it's very simple to remember. One, two, three, four. Okay, great. All right, everyone, please go ahead and cast your vote. I'm going to close the poll. Okay, well, we have some very secure users. 89% said yes, they use a passcode lock on their iPhone or iPad. 8% said no, 2% plus the fifth, and 1%, well, we know what their password is, one, two, three, four. <laughs> okay, well, Stephanie is proud of those 89%, but I am ashamed at the other 10% of you, because you know what's going to happen, guys. You're going to leave your iPad in a taxi cab or in, the, in, in a courtroom, or something's going to happen with your iPhone or your iPad, and if you don't have a passcode on it, 
um, you're just asking for trouble. Um, so I encourage you to change your practices. And the easiest way to change your practice is to get one of the newer iPads, like the iPad Air 2 or the iPad uh, Pro um, or the newest iPad Mini or uh, one of the newer iPhones because they have the fingerprint sensor on them. And then you can set up, this is the iPhone screen, but you also have it on your iPad as well. You can set up a fingerprint sensor so that it's very, very simple for you to unlock your iPad, your iPad or iPhone, you just put your finger on it, um, but a third party couldn't do so without knowing your very complex password, which is hopefully not one, two, three, four. Um, and you know, we carry so much confidential information nowadays that I really encourage all of you to, to change your ways and to use passcode locks. But that's just the minimum. There's other things that I think you need to con be concerned about when it comes to security, and those security concerns are heightened on a portable device like an iPad or an iPhone because it's so much easier for them to get lost or stolen. One thing that I encourage you to consider is um, a VPN software. Your firm may actually have some VPN capabilities for free, or you can buy a third-party app like this one's called Cloak, which costs, I think, $3 a month um, for the basic service. And what it does is it secures your Wi-Fi. So let's imagine you're sitting in a coffee shop and you're typing that email to the client about you know, what your concerns are about how you might lose the case. Because you're using the public Wi-Fi in that coffee shop, if there's some bad guy in the coffee shop, a hacker or something, um, there are very simple tools that they could use to intercept certain communications when you're on a free public Wi-Fi. But if you turn on a VPN service, whether it be a third-party one like Cloak or another one, then that secures your traffic. It puts it to the secure tunnel so that the bad guys can't listen in on your conversations. You know, surely you wouldn't talk on a phone in the coffee shop saying, my settlement authority is $100,000 and so I'm going to start by offering 10000 You would never do that because you would never want someone around you to hear it. Um, but, you know, for the same reason, I encourage you not to have similar mistakes when you're using Wi-Fi. Passwords, we talked about the passcode lock, but we all have other passwords that we use for, you know, whether it's Amazon or eBay or something like that or Quartz Houses. And the problem with passwords is that you need something that you, it's easy to use, but you don't want to use like the same password, you know, you know, uh, kitten1234 for all websites because then once the bad guys uh, hack Home Depot, they can use your same password to get into your account at Target, and I use those examples because those are two companies that actually have had some issues with um, getting their passwords, <laughs> with getting their um, secure information hacked. Um, and so the answer is you need to use different passwords for every service you access, um, but that's hard to remember. And so I encourage you to use a password manager. The one that I use is called 1Password. It's a great app on the iPad and the iPhone, and it lets you automatically create these ridiculously complex passwords. And then you might say, well, Jeff, that looks like a great password, but it would take me like a year to type that. The beauty of these password managers is you don't have to type them. They integrate with Safari on the iPad, and they also work with your computer, whether it be a PC or a Mac, so that you can just type in your single master password, your, your one password, if you will, and then it will automatically say, oh, he's on Amazon, well, that's this password. Or he's on the courthouse for the Eastern District of Louisiana, that's this password. And it will enter them automatically. So um, if you don't currently use these apps, I really encourage you to take a look at them. Um, LastPass is a popular one. One password is my favorite one. Um, it's something to look at for security. We have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to run through just a few more things. There's lots of apps that let you carry the law around on your iPad. I encourage you to look for the apps that are best for your practice, um, or if you use Westlaw or Lexus, they have great apps as well. When you're in depositions, I find an iPad useful for a lot of reasons. I'm just going to give you one case. Let's say you're in a deposition and someone is describing where an incident took place, whether it be a car accident or something else. Um, don't forget that your iPad has the ability to give you a map of anywhere in the world. Um, if you use Apple's built-in maps program, you can get these, um, for most cities, these sort of 3D views of like, this is the uh, Supreme Court of the state of Louisiana uh, in the French Quarter right here in New Orleans. I I'm in New Orleans, by the way. Uh, I guess I mentioned that before. Or if you use the uh, Google Maps app, using Street View on your iPad, you can get like what it looked like from when the van went down the street. And I've had depositions where I would find a location that someone's talking about, take a screenshot of it, either 3D or Street View, whatever's more appropriate for the facts of the case, and then using um, an app, and any drawing app, uh, Adobe Ideas is one that I use, but um, there's tons of them out there. In fact, Adobe's not even selling this one anymore. But And you can, with the witness in a deposition, say, okay, so you walked here, and so let the record reflect there's a blue line to show where this person walked, and a 
red line. Oh, so you were at this corner here, and you can get you know a picture is worth a thousand words, and you can get your deponent to describe things, and then you have this nice, beautiful trial-ready picture that you can send to the court reporter by email, and it will be an exhibit to the deposition, um, and it works great. Um, and there's other examples like that too. I mean, this is a picture of a map, but you might have a picture of the the part that was you know allegedly defective in a product's case or you know where did you stick your hand in the engine okay here's where you stuck your hand in the engine those sorts of things and when you pin down the deponent using pictures in a depot uh, you're much more secure afterwards speaking of after a deposition I also encourage you to uh, look at this app if you if you're a litigator like I am transcript pad is a beautiful app that can take those ASCII files that a court reporter sends you and it can suck them into the app and you can then read the transcript on your iPad and annotate it and when you annotate it you don't just highlight something to say this is important you actually assign it issue codes that you create so I might highlight something and say this one's important because it goes to damages and this one's important because it goes to my statute of limitations defense and this one's important because it goes to something else and then at the end when you've read that deposition or better yet when you've read all your depositions in the case you can just tap a few buttons and the app will give you a report of for example here's every piece of testimony that you thought was important dealing with the statute of limitations so that when you're writing your motion for summary judgment all your testimony is right there. It's it's a great app. It costs ninety dollars. I think it's actually, it's actually on sale right now. Um, if you're a litigator, I strongly encourage you to get it. Um, I want to jump to questions, so I'm just going to run through these last few slides. Fantastical is a great app for uh, calendar. It's much better than the built-in one, although you can use both at the same time. Because in addition to showing you a traditional calendar, it also has this scrollable list of all your upcoming events, like Star Wars. I'm going to see on Saturday. Very excited. Um, so that's really nice. Um, I like Fantastical a few bucks, and there's lots of accessories for the iPads. Um, external batteries are um, great. I love this Anchor PowerPort 6. It costs about thirty dollars on Amazon, and you can take this when you travel and it gives you one, two, three, four, well, as it says, six, six different USB ports. So you can plug in at night your iPad and your iPhone and your Apple Watch and your wife's iPad if you're traveling with her, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that way you don't only have to find one plug in your hotel room or in the conference room, wherever you are. That's a great little device I use. Um, there are stands for supporting your iPad. But we're down to the last uh, 10 minutes or so of the presentation, so I would like to jump into uh, questions. I mentioned, by the way, I, I've just scratched the surface here, but um, if you want more information, I usually post stuff to iPhone JD a couple days a week. So if you go to the website, if you go right over here to where it says subscribe, uh, there's a link you can click to get iPhone JD delivered to you and this is a free service that Google does I, I don't do it but it means that every time I have a post on iPhone JD it will just show up automatically in your email box and I only post a couple times a week so you're not going to get tons of emails but if you are interested in what I have to think about you know cool apps that attorneys might want to use or some of the neatest accessories um, I encourage you to, to go to the website and click on subscribe or just visit the website every day or a couple times a week and that's a good way to get it too but with that Stephanie uh, what questions and stuff do we have yes thank you so much Jeff that was a lot of information and we have a lot of questions um, but first for those of you who have to leave us now please take note of of a couple of things. My case offers a 30-day free trial, and since you attended this webinar today, you get a bonus discount, so please note that promo code 10PAD15 for when you activate your account. Um, secondly, when you close your webinar, that two-question survey will pop up. One question is for current customers, and the other for those who are not yet My Case customers. All it takes is answering one of those questions, and you'll be entered to win $100 Apple gift card, so um, just competing against those who have attended the webinar today. And you'll find out who the winner is by tomorrow. Um, you'll receive that email tomorrow with a link to the blog where you'll find the slides, the webinar recording, and the Apple gift card winner. Um, actually, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind going back to one of the slides, I believe it was slide 48. Um, there was various apps for legal resources, mm -hmm. and a few people requested that you show that again for us. Yeah, what I have on the screen here is I think that everybody should, if you use Westlaw or Lexis or Fastcase, you're going to have one. You're going to want to have one of these on your. Um, 
iPad just so that you know I've used it where I've been in court and my opponent has said oh your honor I forgot to put this in my brief but you know let me give you one more case well you can jump on Westlaw and quickly shepherdize it or, or even just read the case and see you know what your argument is in response to it so that by the time it's time for you to speak you're standing up and you know you're saying well your honor I got the case in front of me and it was overruled or, or you know they're quoting from Headnote 2, but Headnote 4 explains this. So these are useful whether you're in court or, or just out and about. This one that I have right here um, happens to be the Louisiana Civil Code, but it's really a placeholder. Most states um, have somebody has written an app that contains the law for that state. And so whatever state you practice in, I just encourage you to find those so that you always have the law at your fingertips. And um, many of these apps work even if you don't have an internet connection, which sometimes in some courthouses, some older ones you don't, but you can still have all the statutes shoots there. Um, the blue book is sort of nice here, Black's Law Dictionary. You know, I have a Black's Law Dictionary when I was in law school. I'm staring at it at my office. It's collecting dust over there. I never touch it. But I do use it on my iPad because it's always with me. In fact, sometimes I might be there in court and I want to describe a concept. I'll even just like look up the word in Black's, even if I know it, because just looking at like an eight-word definition helps me to articulate whatever argument I want to make you know, that has to do with that concept of law. So these are just some examples of uh, some of the legal apps that I recommend. Okay, great. Um, and so on to our next question. Um, what about handwriting? How do the program deal with handwriting that may not be so good? Right. Well, GoodNotes and some of the other apps, the GoodNotes that I recommended has built-in OCR, optical character recognition. So as you take notes, um, it will uh, read your handwriting to the best that it can, um, which is useful because you can later, if you've got like 20 pages of notes and you want to find that one page where you wrote the word uh, settlement or something, um, you can find it. And then if you export the file to a PDF, it contains the words in it too. So if you have like a document management system at your firm um, you, and you can search full text, it will pull that up. Now, it's got to be able to read your handwriting. And if your handwriting is too poor for even an OCR to read it, I can't help you. All I can tell you is you got to be neat. But I'll tell you, my handwriting, you, you saw an example in the screen earlier. I don't have the neatest handwriting in the world. I'm not like doctor handwriting horrible, but I'm not great. And it works good enough for me that I can often find the word that I'm looking for. Not all the time, but it's, it's, it's nice to have on a crutch. Okay, great. And you actually, I believe, answered the next question, but I will repeat it because a few people asked this. Are digital notes searchable? For example, could I pull up all notes associated with Bob Smith if I were to write Bob Smith at the top of every page of notes? Yes, you can using what I just described, exactly. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So several people had asked that. Um, also inquiring, can you use the Apple Pencil with the iPad Air 2? Not currently, but I predict that in 2016, Apple will come out with the iPad Air 3 that supports it. I guess I hope that they do. Um, you know, there's no reason why the pencil should not be able to support other iPads. Apple needs to change the screen on the iPad so the older models will never support the pencil. But my hope is that going forward, future models will. Okay, great. And is there a way to use Siri to dictate while on the iPad Pro keyboard? Yep, uh, the Siri keyboard has a little microphone just like the iPad, uh, the 10-inch the iPad has it. Same works the same way. Great. So that example you showed us before works with uh, works with it right. as well. The keyboard okay. on the Pro looks different, but it also has a Siri button down there. Okay, excellent. Um, have you had uh, several people inquired about go to my PC and go to webinar on mm -hmm. iPad use? Have you had um, good good luck with that? Yeah, I started using Log Me In, the one that I showed off years ago when it was free, and then I've gotten so used to the program and it's been so dependable for me that I now use it even though I think it now costs $100 a year. Um, I know that Go to My PC and some of the other ones out there um, do the same thing, and I don't know what they currently cost. Some might be cheaper, some might be more expensive, um, but whatever remote access software that you prefer to use, you know, my, my advice is just that you consider using some of it. Um, so I use LogMeIn, but I haven't used the other ones enough to say, uh, you know, don't use this one or to use that one. Okay, great. And a few people asking to repeat the name of the program that syncs your PDF with your computer and your iPad. Dropbox. Oh, there we go. Okay. D-R-O-P-B-O-X, Dropbox. Okay, great. You are just going through these questions really quickly, but there are so many more, so <laughs> we may have some more on the blog. So I'm just going to end with a fun one. Um, do you use a case with your iPad Pro? 
Um, I, for both my iPad Pro and when I used the iPad Air 2, um, I used the Apple Smart Cover. So it's the one that Apple sells that folds up into three so that you can fold it into like a triangle and use it to hold your iPad up at your desk. And then you sort of unfold it and you close it. And because it's got a magnet on it, when it closes, it protects the screen and it turns the screen off automatically. I know that some people prefer to use a bigger case that provides protection on the front and back. In my mind, I see no reason to protect the back of my iPad. I mean, it really hasn't gotten scratched that much, but even if it did, in my mind, it just adds character. But for me, the, the main thing that I want is to keep the iPad as small as possible, which can be a challenge with the iPad Pro. But so, you know, I look to reduce um, any, any size, and cases are bad about adding extra size. But I do think that the screen with all that glass on it needs a little bit of protection, and so I like the Apple Smart Covers for that. Great. Okay. Well, that's it for today. That's all the time we have for today. Jeff, thank you so much for being with us today. I know I learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience did too. And um, everyone, the recording and slides um, and some more questions will be on our blog tomorrow. You'll all receive an email so you can access that. Thank you for joining us today. And Jeff, thanks to you again. Thanks, Stephanie, and thanks to everybody for listening. I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye-bye.